this section is broken down into five parts and it takes a bit of an alternative order to the notes, which gives you um, two approaches to dealing with the material if you get stuck on any of the notes as explanations. It also brings together a lot of pieces uh, of many of the university courses stretching all the way back to first year. If you remember the fundamental theorem of calculus, part B, we're, we're actually going to be making reference to that at some point, but I'll give you a complete list um, of all the things you should sharpen up on. Um, so a lot of what we do in this course builds to a particular example in section 4.3, which I'll now read out loud. An entrepreneur has enough savings to cover their business expenses for a maximum period of six months should they ever become too sick to work. That we need to be more precise about. What is the probability that a particular entrepreneur is too sick to work today and has been too sick to work for more than six months given that they were healthy when they started their business five years ago? Um, it's uh, got a lot of moving parts, but you'll see by the time we get to section four, we'll have a lot of theory to draw on uh, and a lot of um, ideas on how to approach this problem. I just wanted to list for this particular problem, three things I want to call deal breakers. There might be more deal breakers. Um, just because the model maybe models these three things doesn't mean it's a good model. These are just three things that if we don't see them in our model, we probably would consider the model a failure. The first one is that the model correctly increases its mortality and morbidity rates as the entrepreneur ages. You cannot have a model, um, if, we're going, we're, if we're dealing with periods of longer than five years, we really should be capturing aging in there somewhere. Secondly, the recovery rates of the entrepreneur must be dependent correctly on the duration of the illness. If someone has had a condition and this depends by condition, but if you've had a condition for a long time, you're more likely to have it in the next month uh, than if you had had it only quick, uh, only recently. Um, this, uh, as I said, varies from illness to illness, but we cannot assume that recovery rates from illness remains unchanged given that you have an illness. The last deal breaker uh, is that our model should reflect the entrepreneur's medical history, both now and in the future. So what I mean by now is if, if we already know a person to be sickly, our model should cater for that. But because we're making long-term projections, we should keep in mind that when some of our uh, entrepreneurs claim, or when our entrepreneur claims, he would have at that point built up a medical history. And his claim rate from that point on would be elevated. If someone has shown to be too sick to work at one point, it actually tells us a lot of information about them that they'll be too sick to work again in the future. So these are three dynamics that we want our model to capture and you'll see we'll do quite a good job about capturing all of these. I'm not going to give a formal model definition at this point. Um, I am just going to talk about this loosely, vaguely. We're going to make all of these things very precise. But let's define a state space. Because we're gonna be working with probability theory, we probably want to start by defining all our possible outcomes. A person can be healthy at any point in time, too sick to work, uh, or dead. There could be more states, but these are the three least number of states we would need. This is actually um, quite a common example, and you'll see it throughout the notes. It's called the healthy, sick, dead model. If we could loosely talk about it, we know people can go from healthy to sick and from sick to healthy. These arrows for now are loose. Later on, we will make them more precise. And you could go to the dead states uh, from any point in time. Uh, there's some, some generic um, notation for, for this particular model. Going from healthy to sick, we pick sigma because it's, it sounds like sick. To go from sick to healthy is to recover. We reserve rho for that. We reserve mu, as we always do for going from healthy to dead, and nu, which looks like a v, um, from, particularly from sick to dead. We go, you're going to be seeing this picture so much, it's worth just memorizing uh, that notation. So in second year, we really focused on random variables, which are static things static quantities, either continuous or discrete. Um, and we also focus on joint distributions between more than two random variables. 
in this course, we're going to be looking at a random process as so something that evolves over time. A person can be healthy for some time, jump to the sixth state and back. Um, so there are two ways to think about it. You either have time passing discreetly, in other words, one month at a time or one day at a time, or you can have continuous time where it's constantly flowing um, from zero onwards. In discrete time, we can say, well, our random variable, we want a sequence of random variables, and they can take on the value of any one of those three states. So we literally can list them because it's discrete time, we can literally write them out in this way. And we can really say a process is a set of random variables where we're interested in the natural numbers, potentially starting from zero or one, doesn't really matter, it's just a matter of labeling. This is not a sequence of random variables. A sequence of random variables would just be a sequence of marginal distributions. We're interested in the joint behavior of all of these random variables as they merge over time. So to, to think about a, a process is not a sequence of random variables, but a joint distribution of ordered random variables. Same analogy goes for continuous time. This time we're just ordering our random variables by the positive real numbers. The point I'm trying to make with this model definition really is that we've never modeled a, an unknown quantity as it evolves over time but we have, we have worked with joint distributions before, and a process is nothing but a joint distribution of random variables that come with it, also a time space that orders them. Um, so we actually have all the maths that we need. We've you know, often only worked with joint distributions between two or three. Uh, this time we'll be working with n or even infinitely many joint distributions. Uh, you have to know the marginal distributions, but you also have to know more than that. It's not to know that the joint distribution, as we said, it's not enough to just know how each of them behaves independently. You have to know how they, how they behave together. I'm going to make all of this a lot more formal. This is just um, an introduction. And here I just, um, you can pause the video to read this. This is just a description of the kinds of data that I intuitively would think I would need to be able to estimate the parameters of this model. Again, once we've got a formal definition of a model, we'll be able to specify our formal likelihood function, and therefore the data that we need to formally uh, calculate the maximum likelihood estimates for our model. But here's just a starting intuitive stab um, at what data we'll need to parameterize this model. Pause the video if that was too quick for you. This slide just lists some topics that are worth refreshing your memory on, and they come from earlier courses. Um, none of them are in a particular great amount of detail, but it, it, I'll, I'll point out which ones you should focus on. So joint probability distributions and mixed probability distributions are very important. Mixed in the sense of they're neither continuous nor discrete. Um, depends on, say, a coin flip, whether the outcome is a real number or a... Um, integer. Those will come up. The assumptions behind the Poisson distribution or the assumptions behind deriving uh, the Poisson distribution comes up once or twice. It's a convenient uh, distribution sometimes for insurance claims questions. Um, it's, I definitely make reference to that at least once. It's, it's worth a brief refresher. Then we have the law of total probability, which um, would have been mentioned in a stats course, but uh, maybe some people don't remember it, or maybe it wasn't mentioned. Um, there's a particular version of the law of total probability that we are going to be interested in. That is the conditional variation. So it's expressed as follows. Um, A given B N intersection C times the probability of B N intersection C. And this is across n, which is um, 
you'll see N, B is defined as a partition. Um, so N essentially sums across all the subsets that make up the entire state space. So it's this particular version of the law of probability that we'll be applying once or twice. Please remind yourself that matrix multiplication is always associative, but not always commutative. Go remind yourself what that means. Eigenvalues of matrices will pop up once or twice in, uh, in past papers in a very simple way. So you don't have to understand something too deep about eigenvalues. Eigenvalues just happen to coincide with our definition of a stationary distribution. Um, as simple as that, and you'll know what that means quite soon. Uh, remind yourself about mathematical induction. I think we use it twice. Um, worth remem remembering how to do that. Very important that you learn. So I guess the stars are the most important ones. Um, very important that you remind yourself of basic differential equations and how to solve them. The integrating factor method, for example, um, integrating on both sides, being comfortable with that. Again, please look into that. I think there might be an appendix in the notes that also gives you a brief refresher. Maximum likelihood estimates are, are key. We're going to be looking at those again. Um, especially in section four, we'll be looking at an interesting example where one of our parameters won't be a maximum likelihood estimate. Um, so it will be nice for you to see an alternative way of estimating parameters, um, but it will still, the main focus there will be on maximum likelihoods. The chi-squared goodness of fit test comes up once or twice, not worth knowing in too much detail, knowing the test statistic is probably good enough. Central limit theorem comes up once again when we think about one of our estimators is a random variable itself. Uh, we do invoke the central limit theorem once, um, doesn't come up that much. And then the chain rule of probabilities, again, something from that should have been in stats 204. If not, it's just worth um, reading up about it a little bit. Here I have the definition on the right. Um, it basically tells us how we can express um, the uh, joint probability um, for a particular event um, as a conditionals and a different probability. And you can obviously apply this rule to itself iteratively, which is why um, it's called the chain rule. These two formulas in these two shapes actually coincide. They look very similar. So they're related, uh, but yeah, you can also talk about them differently uh, or in, in separate circumstances. Worth looking at the stars first. Um, these two mainly will be not applied in, in solving any of our uh, applied problems, but in, in two or three of our theorems. Um, maybe this is an odd time to be doing this, but let me get it out the way. Um, I've just come up with a few exam tips that are worth keeping at the back of your mind um, while you're doing uh, some of your practice questions and going through these slides. Firstly, past papers don't cover the entire syllabus. The idea is if you just started doing past papers and reading the material as you needed it to um, solve the problems, you'll probably only um, get to 80% or 90% of the material, maybe even a bit less. Um, don't spend more than 75% of your time just doing past papers. They're an excellent way of getting used to the types of questions that get asked, get really quick at spotting how to solve a problem, but do try to spend at least, you know, one in four days that you spend on this section, just understanding the theory as it stands in the notes. Uh, learn all the proofs in the notes, but focus on the applications. As I said, this is an applied course. Um, and also learn the extra proofs that come from lectures that are not in the notes. I've only included proofs if I think that they will um, enhance your understanding of the material. And three in particular I list there. Um, not more than that. I'm not introducing a whole bunch of extra theorems. Just go check out these three um, at the end and, and keep in mind that they could be asked. Some of them, um, you know, could even have just been asked as questions out of the blue. Um, and they have been in some UCT past papers, um, but I just make it explicit that you should, um, you should learn those. The third bullet says, there are some demanding questions out there, but stay calm because firstly, there'll always be some aspect of a difficult question that is easy or is doable. 
um, at least two, the first two or three marks, just giving, starting with your definition of the mark of chain, it will always be possible to score some basic marks. Secondly, if you just keep moving on with other questions, there's definitely time for the penny to sort of drop in some uh, instances. And um, if there's a question that's truly difficult, something that really requires you to apply yourself, something very unfamiliar, it will never be a great number of marks. And I can probably you know, say all the, uh, the past institute exams I've looked at definitely have that feature and UCT exams as well. If something looks unfamiliar or potentially difficult, chances are that it's a very, very small part of the, the marks that really is difficult. You should always try to remind yourself of what you know, and it's more likely that you'll probably figure out what to do next. The fourth bullet uh, says there are some easy past questions, but the examiner will normally make you work very hard for very few marks. Um, there, there's definitely an element of these questions, uh, of some, some, some of this content that is very easy. But the moment you see a very easy question, you'll normally see you have to multiply out four matrices for three marks. Um, so don't get overly excited if you see an easy question. Uh, UCT exams definitely require a little bit more extra preparation and understanding than the actuarial society exams. Historically, I think this is true, at least for this section. Um, and as I, oh, I just repeated my, my email address over there. Great, um, the next video will be posted. It is gonna start as part one of five. Um, I hope it's useful.